Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. opportunity to record a podcast with Dr. Peterson. Before we get to that episode, I want you to go to onlinegreatbooks.com and you can either sign up for our VIP waiting list and get some goodies from us. You'll get a executive uh, executive summary of how to read a book. You'll get a synopsis of our reading list and some other resources that'll be useful to you. I'll make it worth your, your email address if you do that. Or you can go and actually sign up and join our service. If you use the promo code Peterson, You'll get 25% off your first three months with us. So go to onlinegreatbooks.com and enter the promo code Peterson and enjoy the show. Thanks. Hello, Scott. Yes, sir. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I'll just go right into it. I've got Dr. Okay. Jordan Peterson with me. He needs no introduction. You guys know who he is. And uh, we're going to discuss the great books today and what they mean to Dr. Peterson. So thank you for doing this with me. My I, pleasure. I read your 12 Rules for Life and, and Maps of Meaning, and you quote from the books of the Western canon all the time. And, uh, you know, it's my belief that these books are for everyone. They're not just for academics. And so tell me, tell They're me hardly what, for academics at all anymore. Uh, anymore. I, I agree with that. Uh, tell, tell me why you think that, uh, that we as normal people who are just trying to live good lives should read these books. Well, that's the issue there. The issue that you, that you just discussed there at the end is to live a good life. It's like, well, what, what do you mean by that exactly? And that's what the humanities is about. The humanities are about. They're about how to live a good life and, and concretely, like if, if the abstractions in the great books are taught properly, then they help you understand what a good life might be. And you might say, well, why should I bother? And, and the answer to that is, well, how much unnecessary misery, suffering and horror do you want? The alternative to that is to live as good a life as you can. And then, well, and you have to think that through and, or, or not. But if you don't think it through, then you're sort of stumbling around in the darkness. And so you, you want to read great books because they help you learn to, to think and to speak. And even both of those things, it's, it's, I mean, you have to think so that you can figure out how to act because thinking is the precursor to action unless the action is impulsive, in which case it's going to lead you into dark places very frequently. Right. And if you can learn to speak and well, as well and formulate your thoughts properly, and so that's also why it's necessary to, to write if you're going to be reading right is right. well then you're you're better at formulating what you want to need and you're better at making plans and you're better at negotiating and you're better at gr bringing people together and establishing a consensus and you're better at making your case if you need to negotiate for your salary it's like all of that is un of unbelievable practical utility yeah, so so we we think that you don't just read the books, right? There's the trivium, the grammar, the logic, the rhetoric, right? We get the grammar, we learn the kind of the bones of the subject in front of us, the bones of a particular kind of philosophy, maybe. And then we understand the logic, and we start to assemble those bones of that. And then we have to have the rhetoric part. That's the that's the persuasion part that you're talking about, or the the teaching part. And so you know, at onlinegreatbooks.com, we don't just read the stuff. We also get in these Socratic seminars where we discuss it and hold each other accountable for what we say. And, you know, that, that, that piece, that piece where we talk about the things that are difficult, I think is the, is the part that makes, you know, discussing these books mo maybe more important than reading them, right? You have well, to read them to discuss them, but you ha I think it's well, more important. Conceivably, I mean, well, at least reading them gives everybody a central, it gives everyone something to concentrate on while they're speaking or writing. But I mean, partly what you're doing with, when you're using the Socratic method is you're improving your ability to communicate. Right. So, so, and there isn't anything that's better than that, that, that's better for you than that. I mean, because so much depends on everything you do with other people and every, every, every abstraction that you formulate that's dependent on thought is dependent on your ability to communicate properly. And so the more you sharpen that, the more you get, more you get better at everything. So 
you know, your comment about whether it's the reading or it's the discussion that that's of primary relevance, it's like, well, it's not obvious because it's not obvious what a good university does. Certainly it introduces people to books that are worth reading. But even that's part of the Socratic dialogue, because if you're reading properly, you're having a discussion with the author. You know, you mm -hmm. read and then you think for a while and then you read again and you think for a while and then that's all the pro drama, let's say, to being able to formulate your thoughts so that you can discuss them with others. The, the crucial issue is to sharpen your logos, right? Is to sharpen your ability to use communication to orient yourself in the world. And it's, people think the humanities aren't practical. It's like, that's just, out, if they're not practical, they're, they're taught or understood wrong. They're more practical than anything else because everything depends on communication. Yeah, we, we don't even believe in teaching. In fact, I tell the folks that lead our so Socratic seminars that if they get caught teaching, they're fired, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're there to hold the reader accountable for what they say they believe, right? If the guy says, well, I believe this about, I don't know, the Gorgias, you know, reading some Plato, he needs to be able to explain to us why he believes that. We don't necessarily have to agree, but he needs to know why right. he believes what he believes. So we don't want to teach. You know, we, I think that I think that's, that's right. You don't want to give advice. No, I don't want to. No, I don't want to. I don't. I, it's just so arrogant to think that you could teach Plato. Yes, it's like no, they're not your ideas. They're someone else's ideas, and they're not in great shape. <laughs> and right. so you then you you start reading, and you think, oh, I see. This is how this fits together, and this needs to be fleshed out, and this is where I'm weak, and where my foundation is is damaged, and my superstructure isn't organized properly, and so. The thing, this is also the thing that people don't understand about history. History is actually you. When you're reading history, you're reading about you. You think, well, these are other people. It's like, no, you're the product of history. And unless you understand history, you don't understand who you are. And the history of ideas is the same thing. Is It's not like you're not living out those ideas. Yes. So, so you bring up, you bring up history and the, and and ideas, or like as a, maybe ideas in a scope of history. So do you, do you believe there's such a thing as a Western canon? You know, that's a, that's a question that people are debating somehow. Well, I think, I think it's a stupid question. <laughs> I think, well, I do. I think it's technically a stupid question. Here's why. Imagine that you could rank order books by how much influence they had on other books. Mm -hmm. So there's some books that are hardly influential at all. And then there's some books like the Bible or Paradise Lost or Dante's Inferno that have influenced almost every book you can imagine. Right. Well, those are that's the canon. It's not some arbitrary decision. It's like the rank order all the books in terms of their influence. Take the hundred books that have influenced the most other books. That's the canon. And the postmodernists say, well, that's all arbitrary. It's not arbitrary. It's just a map. Right. Right. Yeah. So. And, you know, so why is Plato part of the canon? Well, because partly because of where he was situated in history. You know, he, he was he was among the first to be encapsulated in in the written word, so Socrates. And he's been of unbelievable influence. So the reason you want to read Socrates, read Plato, is because he's everywhere. That's right. He's everywhere. The canon, I believe, and when what you're saying seems to jive with this, it's it's emergent. It's so if you pick up Nietzsche, yes, emergent. If you pick up Nietzsche, he's going to say something about Kant. He's like, "Gosh, I need to go read this Kant guy." And then you yeah. pick that up, and then he says something about Aquinas. Well, gosh, you know, you go pick him up. You drill all the way down. You end up at Homer, right? And in any of these books, they're they're self referential, and you can draw a family yes. tree of these ideas. And That's the, exactly right. Yeah, you draw you draw the family tree, and you look for the for the for the most influential ancestors. That's the canon. It's not like a bunch of people got, it's not like a bunch of dead white men got together and had a vote. <laughs> right. This is so dumb. It's like, it's obvious that there's a canon. Now, that doesn't mean that the canon is without flaws. It doesn't mean that there aren't new books that might have interesting ideas in them. It doesn't mean any of that. But it does mean that we already have a structure of thought and a structure of society. And those books are the, the fundamental building blocks of that structure. So it's just a, it's just a, indication of how far off the mark the universities have fallen to to note that the question is there a canon could even exist it's like if you ask that all that it means is you don't know what a canon is right 
Right. So it's like the, you you can dispute, you can debate about the v utility of the biblical stories. That's fine. But what you can't debate is that they're foundational. They're absolutely foundational. So do you need to know them? Well, it depends on what you mean by need. Do you need to understand who you are? Well, if you want to pilot yourself through life with some degree of, of, of what, nobility, I like that word, right. then you should understand who you are. And the more you understand, the better. So, yeah, it's... In fact, you say the no nobility idea. Uh, in fact, our, our new online Great Books t-shirts say on the back say, the noble things are difficult. Yeah, great. Let's <laughs> read this stuff so hard sometimes. Uh, so tell me, which of these books did you read and then where it clicked that there was a canon or that this was a great conversation that you could eavesdrop on? Does that make sense? Like for me, I picked up The Republic, The Plato's Republic, and there were ideas in there and names mentioned that I wasn't hip to. And I thought, oh, my gosh, there's something going on here. And I've stumbled into it. Well, I was fortunate when I was a kid, you know, I started reading reasonably good books when I was about 13 because I had a librarian <clears throat> who was feeding them to me. And they were more books that would be part of the modern canon. Um, George Orwell, Aldous Huxley, yep. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, um, Hemingway, you know, the, the people who've been regarded as the masters of 20th century literature, let's say. What was that librarian's name? Her name was Sandra Notley. Sandra Notley. And she was the she was the wife of the member of parliament for our district, oh. provi provincially, so at the state level, let's say. And she was also the wife of the only socialist member of government in our state, in Alberta, in our province. So and I so, but she was one of these people who, despite the fact sh that she was left leaning, she had me read all sorts of things, including Ayn Rand. Mm -hmm because she thought, well, I should expose myself to the opposing points of view as well. So, so that was my first introduction, I would say. And then I was fortunate. I went to a small college about 90 miles from my town, way up in northern Alberta, called Grand Prairie Regional College. And I had some excellent professors there, some people who really wanted to teach. One of them was named Dennis Wheeler. He was a professor of political science, which is my first major. And we my, myself and a couple of friends had a small seminar with him where we read great books, the great works of political philosophy, you know, or we familiarized ourselves with them anyways. I mean, there's a limit to how many great books you can read in one semester or right. one year, but we at least familiarized ourselves with um, Thomas Hobbes, The Leviathan and The Republic. And I don't remember which book, which book we were introduced to, um, which one, which, which of Aristotle's works. But, but a whole sequence of classic works in political philosophy. And so, and at the same time, I was taking literature with another professor, um, Robin, his name escapes me, unfortunately, but he was also a very good professor of English. He was the first person who really taught me how to read, or write. I thought I could write because I always got good grades in high school, but I couldn't write at all. It's just that everyone else wrote abysmal, abysmally, <laughs> and I was only dismal. Right. So, so... um he, you know, and that's where we read the, the, some of the great books of the 20th century. And that's where I first familiarized myself with what great literature might be. And so, and then of course, when I was right, when I, when I continued my education, well, I kept expanding my reading outward and I became more and more aware that there was a great conversation that had extended over centuries. And, um, I got more and more interested in, I suppose, as I got even interested in deeper literature, I got more interested in religious ideas too, because at some point deep literature shades into religious ideation. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and I mean, just last week I was reading a book on Kant by Roger Scruton. It was an introduction to Kant's thinking because I was having a debate about with Sam Harris about the relationship between facts and values. Like you, if you're a thinker, you have to go back and familiarize yourself with as much of this thought as you possibly can, because otherwise you just, it's like you have great gaps in your, it's like you have, it's like you have brain damage. <laughs> if you don't know these arguments, it's like you have a real low resolution representation of the ideas and you're kind of running on that, but it doesn't have the depth and sophistication that's necessary. And you think, well, why is it necessary? It's like, well, you have to make ethical decisions in your life and you have to justify them. So, so would you say that this 
you know, reading these books, you say it's necessary, and I clearly I agree, but my money where my mouth is and trying to make this happen for people. Um, it, I mean, the fact that it's necessary, does that allude to the this being an, a liberal education? I mean, that which that that education well, no, well, which makes reason, us free. There's a reason by there's a reason why rich people always have their children undergo a liberal education. It's not like these people are stupid. <laughs> right. They knew that that was, a, that was a practical guide to leadership. You know, it wasn't as concretely useful as an engineering degree might be. And believe me, I'm not saying anything negative about engineering degrees. I like engineers. I like the way they think because they're mm -hmm. really bound by practical necessity. So I've got great admiration for engineers. But the, the thing is, is that a liberal arts education teaches you how to communicate and strategize in a deep manner. And if you're going to operate at the highest levels, you it isn't optional. Like I've watched this for years and I've known some people who have been extraordinarily powerful and influential in, in the best possible way because it was allied with their competence. And like those people know how to formulate an argument, man. Great right. lawyers, they formulate an argument. You, you don't mess with their argument. It's rock bloody solid. And so they... They, they, they can move forward in a eff massively effective way in the world. And everyone I've ever met who's become radically successful is incredibly good at articulating their position. Right. That's that rhetoric part. And so many law schools still you teach by the Socratic method, or at least a lot of their classes are in the Socratic method. I, I certainly believe in it. Yeah. Well, a lawyer without an argument is just without an argument. And an argument is a clerk. Like an argument isn't. Yeah. Well, exactly. Exactly. Right. And it's even more than that. It's like a lawyer who isn't a clerk who can't negotiate with clients and expand the business is just a lawyer. Like the people who are operating at the top of the legal profession, not only can they do what a clerk does and can they do what a lawyer does, but they can also go out there among strangers and drum up business and charm people and 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 it isn't and it isn't it isn't manipulative. Not if they're good at it. Sometimes it, sometimes manipulators can get ahead, but mo but most of the time people figure them out and toss them away, and then they have to go manipulate somewhere else. The people who are spectacularly successful are gifted at communication in every realm they attempt, and a lot of that's allied with deep knowledge. But even more importantly, the ability to utilize words with incredible facility. And reading really helps that and 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 discussing what you read and writing about it. Those things aren't, if you want to operate effectively in the world, those aren't optional. Yeah, it it's like, well, it, until we get some sort of a, a USB cable where I can hook my consciousness directly to yours, the words are the only way that we can do that. The words, the words are the only way that we can connect to the other. And if we don't listen carefully, read carefully, and then speak carefully, speak carefully, you, you yep. can't have an authentic connection with the other person. Well, and you, the other thing too is we'll never be able to hook our consciousnesses directly together to some degree because you're different than me, and that means you have to take the wisdom that's generic in some sense, and you have to make it yours. Mm -hmm. And the way you make it yours is by translating it into your own words. You know, like every writing coach says, use your own words. But they never say why. And the answer to the question, why should you use your own words, is because it isn't yours until you formulate it in your own words. And so you say, well, who cares if it's yours? It's like, look, these are tools. Unless they're fitted for your grasp, you can't use them. Right. And you might say, well, why do you need tools? It's like, well, what do you want to confront the world without tools? Good luck to you. So in our logo... In our logo, there's a there's an anvil in it. It's a little crest. There's an anvil in it. And, and Carl Schut, who teaches a, or leads a lot of our seminars, he says that these great books are the anvil against which we beat our brains to make them into better tools suited for our lives. Yeah, that's good. Sure, absolutely. The yeah. anvil the anvil motif is a really good one because you have to heat and tap iron to make it to make it to temper it. Right. Yeah. And it, the heat is often the heat of the discussion. A heated discussion is a discussion that can produce transformation. Especially if everyone keeps their temper, mm. you know, and, and that's also another metallurgic uh, metaphor. Yeah, we, yeah. when we go into these seminars, we make arguments, and we should make arguments, right? If, we, if I believe something, I'm trying to get you to believe the same thing or to come around to my way of thinking or at least understand what I'm trying to say. I need to make a series of, of statements that support what I think so that you can understand that. Those are arguments. Arguments have been um, 
the, the, the meaning of that word has changed, and now it's a vituperative, angry interaction. Yeah. And, you know, I, I well, want more people... Well, that is what it is if the people... That is what an argument is if the people who are conducting it aren't articulate and, wi articulate and wise. Like, an argument is how people who can't think, think. Oh, a wow. A vituperative yeah. argument is how people who can't think, think. And they can't think very well, and so it degenerates. And then it can degenerate into physical combat, and that's how people who really can't think, think. Hmm. So, so you think that when you get when there's an angry exchange of words, that that is a manifestation of that some just you know this anger that that person carries with them. Sure. Well, look. What do you tell a three year old who's having a temper tantrum? Use your words. Hmm. Well, the three year old can't, which is why they're having a temper tantrum. And I mean, look. I'm not saying that every discussion should be without emotion. You can, you can, you can flavor your discussion with emotion. You know. Because a, a bit of a bit of aggression, let's say, that's integrated into the argument can make it more forceful and it can push through opposition. But it's only when the it's only when the articulated space degenerates that the that the that the aggression is necessary. And it's rather counterproductive. Like generally speaking, if you can hold your temper, it shows that you're the better man. Hmm. I, I just had a I did a, a podcast. I was a guest on a podcast, and we, we compared and contrasted Edmund Burke's uh, Reflections on the Revol Revolution in France with some work by Voltaire. And I was in there with some really smart guys, and we essentially just had a seminar. And when we got and, and we didn't agree about hardly anything. <laughs> and when I got done with that, man, I was just wrung out. Right, yeah. It was a super intense experience, and I had to stop and think about what had happened and um, and make myself not react in an angry way. I mean, it's so confrontational to have your ideas, um, well, criticized, picked apart. Uh, yep. it, it, it feels so confrontational. Well, you don't want to have your tools destroyed, mm. even if they're not very good. You know, like maybe you're out there trying to chop down a tree with a hammer, and <laughs> someone comes along and says, you know, that's not an ax, and you say, well, it's better than the palm of my hand. But it's, but it's true that it's not as good in, as an ax. And so what you want to, I guess, part of the way that you can maintain your temper when you're trying to defend your ideas is to continue to hope that what the argument will do is provide you with better tools. Right. That's exactly and right. A good, a good argument should do that. You should both emerge from a good argument with better tools, not with no tools. <laughs> That's not so good. Sometimes that happens, you know, but, but, there are, but the point should be to furnish everyone with even better tools. And when I got done with that discussion, that was actually the conclusion I made was, you know, uh, they proved me wrong in a couple of these places, but I understand this better and I'm better for it. But my first reaction was I was, I was pissed off yeah, <laughs> you know? and I know better, but, and we do that yeah. and we have, and I got 150 people right now that are uh, reading either Plato or Aeschylus or Euripides or Sophocles or uh, Homer. And they're doing that to each other for two hours a month in these seminars and sometimes I watch in, look in and I have to turn the camera off because we do these in these Zoom classrooms. I've turned the camera off yeah. and I just tear up because they're just, you know, there's, there are guys that do work in body shops and mechanics and oh, yeah, just man. normal people in there just going at it. And, uh, I know it's so cool. Well, I see the same thing in this tour, you know, mm. like, and people are, well, I, we saw the same thing in Vancouver. I just went there and had a, a two, two and a half hour public discussions with Sam Harris about the relationship between facts and values, which is a very esoteric subject, but a very crucial one, or about the relationship between science and religion, because that's another way of thinking about it, or facts and ethics, another way of thinking about it. And there's 3,000 people there each night, and they're just glued right to it. It turns out that people, there's a hunger for this. It's obviously a hunger that you're partly feeding. And it's because this, this is valuable. It's unbelievably valuable. Your life depends on it. So strangely, you know, it's, it's, it is, it's not, it's not optional if you want to avoid stupid suffering. Thinking <laughs> is not optional if you want to avoid stupid suffering. There, there's a certain amount of suffering that comes from this too, which is, yes. you know, it's almost like you, when, once you've read some of these things, it's At least almost that's like, voluntary. It's voluntary and sacrificial. It's like, okay, I'm going to put myself, it's like lifting weights. It hurts, mm -hmm. but you hope that you hope that the sacrifice pays off with future gain for everyone, and I, it certainly does. So, so, what do you think that your project is at this point? Like, 
you know, I, I, I want people to read these books. I want people to, uh, I want people to be able to enter into discourse with p- other people in their lives every day in a that's more a civil and deeper way. I mean, that's kind of what my project is. Yeah, that's a good project, man. That's the furtherance of the logos. It's like, let's make everybody more articulate. So what's, what's Let's Peterson's? ground them better in the ancient wisdom. What's May, that'll make everybody's now? life better. What's that? What's Peterson's project right now? Oh, yeah. that's it. I would say it's an, it's a variant of that. I mean, it breaks down into other things. I mean, I, I'm doing this lecture tour right now, but mostly what I'm doing with that tour is having a discussion with people about vision and responsibility and why there's meaning to be had in the adoption of responsibility under the guide guidelines of a of a sophisticated vision and why that's not optional. It's like it's the same thing. Like. In some sense, you're having people read these great books so that they can sharpen their vision of the world. It's like, well, why? Well, so you have great things to aim at. Well, why do you want great things to aim at? Because there's meaning in aiming at what's great. Yeah, we well, want, why do you need meaning? Because it's the antidote to suffering. Yeah, we want greatness and nobility in our lives. In well, our- unless we want the opposite, which is weakness and weakness and cowardice. We want that? It's No, it just makes everything worse. Gosh, do people want... Do, do people ever want something that they know is bad? Oh, sure. All the time. Because, the, you know, lots of times when you want something that you know is good, it requires sacrifice because you have to delay gratification. And so so lots of times people will go for impulsive short-term pleasures. Well, it, well but, they, but they, see the, they see the good in the short-term pleasure. You know, Plato and the Mino. Yeah, but so it's I, usually because they're all, <laughs> yeah, yes and no. You know, it's pretty fun to go out and have 10 beer, but... Um, most people know that that's not so good as a, that's a really nice three hour decision, but as a 48 hour decision, it's really not a very good one. So, so, so scale and, matters. And, well, yeah, yeah. The, the time frame matters. Yeah, exactly. And there's lots of things that appear positive and attractive in the very short term that are, you know, not so good in the medium term and absolutely bloody catastrophic in the long term. But that doesn't mean that sacrificing those pleasures is easy. Or that it comes without a cost, you know. So it's easy for people to avoid what's difficult and responsible, but the problem is it doesn't work. <laughs> right. You know, I ha- that's the biggest. That's the biggest uh, obstacle to getting people to read these books is, you know, foregoing a short-term pleasure or short-term gain for the long-term gain. That, it, hey, that do you have audio represent. book versions of them? Well, I mean, they they are out there. Uh, they certainly are out there. We send everyone a hard copy, uh, you know, but uh, they they certainly are available, you know. I'm well, prejudiced. you know, one of the things I've noticed is that a lot more people can listen than can read. C- certainly, certainly. Yeah, so, so you know, that might be something to discuss with your students, is that they could use an amalgam. Or, but the other thing about listening that's really helpful is that you can do it when you're doing other things. Right. I, I tell you, I'm not smart enough to multitask and take in some Aristotle. Well, fair enough. But you might be able to multitask while you were doing dishes or something that was really mundane. Right. Yeah, so, you know, getting the people to forego forego those short term gains for this longer term project is really tough, you know. And but I keep telling people, five years is going to pass. Now, five years yes. from now, you could have possibly read, you know, t- twelve thousand pages of these fantastic books, or you could have binge watched another series on, you know, HBO or whatever. How do I make this argument for people? How do I get people? Oh, to... that's a good argument. <laughs> well, I I think the argument. Well, I think the the argument. I, I sort of made it in a condensed form when when I was talking about the relationship between responsibility and meaning. It's like, well, do you need to know how to think or not? Right. Well, yes. Why? Because you have to think about what you're going to do and what you're going to see and what you're going to aim at. Well, what if you don't? Well, then you see badly, you aim wrong, and you suffer, and so do the people around you. It's like, well, do you, so you better learn to think. Okay, I need to learn to think. Well, who are you going to learn from? Well, how about the best? Right. Well, right. I want to learn from the worst. Well, maybe you can't learn from the best because it, you're not sophisticated enough to start with the best. Well, but your co- your approach help, helps 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 scaffold people for that. It's like if you're going to learn to think, learn from the best, which is why we had a canon in the universities, is so that people could go there and they could learn from the best. We say, well, the best that's arbitrary. It's like no, it's not. No. The best, by definition, at least the definition that works here is the best is what's had the broadest range of influence. And that's at least the best to understand who we are now, which is something, you right. know. 
Yep. Maybe you could add to that something else you need to know to figure out where we should go. But we could at least start out by figuring out where we are and why. Yeah, knowing where you are is essential for figuring out where you're going to get well, where you're going yeah, to try, go. Try using a map without knowing where you are. I, it's not helpful. Well, this has been our 45 minutes, sir. I certainly hate to. Yes. I want to be respectful of your time. But Appreciate that. Thank you so much for uh, for be, being willing to do, to do this, and thank you so much for your work every day. I know that my pleasure. Thanks for giving Good me this time you. today. You bet. Good luck with your project. I hope you get a thousand people signed up for it. Uh, me too. Uh, you're going to be a big help in that. I thank you so well, much. Well, it'll be interesting to see how people respond to the tweet. I'll give you a report. Okay. Good. Thank you, sir. That was the show with Dr. Peterson. That was high pressure. I was super, super nervous. I'm not a person that really gets nervous very often. Uh, do public speaking from time to time and record a, another podcast. And yeah, I don't get nervous, but uh, I was shaken during that. He's a he's a very kind and patient man, uh, but it's, he's just he's so verbally acute and so fast that I, I found myself be, really being intimidated. But I hope you guys enjoyed it. I certainly did. Once the smoke cleared and my adrenaline went away, uh, I was really glad I did it. And uh, I feel like I'm a better person for it. And I hope I hope you guys are too. Uh, just a reminder, we don't, we don't do this thing entirely for free. We do this because I want you guys to sign up. So go to onlinegreatbooks.com and enter that promo code Peterson to get 25% off uh, your first three months with us. Uh, I mean, he's given us a ringing endorsement, and I hope you want to try to read these books. Uh, uh, certainly you can try to do that on your own. You know, I encourage people to do that but if you're ready to join a community and actually do that seminar and take part in the rhetoric portion of this, uh, this study that, that Dr. Peterson and I talked about so much. Uh, go, and, go and try it out with us. We'll help you in any way we can. Thanks for listening. <laughs>